Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project, or rather two projects today as I did end up making a wearable mock-up of this design before I jumped into the real thing. And though I had never made a cape pattern before, for some reason I don't have a single cape or cloak in my closet, so I had to remedy that, but uh, all rumors pointed towards this actually being a very simple design to go ahead and create. So let's jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started. Beginning with a large sheet of paper, in my case alphanumeric paper, as usual. And I will grab my bodice pattern just as a base to start with, and I'll line that up to a squared off line just so I have a nice kind of right angle to start with for the neckline here. And I'm just going to trace the top half of this because that's all I'll really need. And there are many how to make a cape pattern or cape DIY uh, guides in both my pattern drafting books and online, so most of them seem to say come out about an inch and a half from the shoulder and use that as a basis for curving down outwards. They also all gave different but very specific angles that you needed to make the side at, but I, I, I kind of just followed the angle of the side seam from above for the dart in the side and just figured that that would be all right. And this first cape I'm making here is going to be a wearable mock-up anyhow. I knew it was going to be close, but I did want to make a wearable mock-up first before I dove into the very pretty fabrics I had to use for my second cape today. I made this 42 inches long, so I was just making sure that the side seam and the front were both 42 inches long and drew a curve between the two of them. You can just label this a little bit. I will leave about a 10 inch gap along the side seam as well for me to be able to put my arm or hands through this if I need to, you know, reach for something or grab something or use my hands at all while wearing this cape. So I just make sure I have that gap drawn in here so I know where to put it when I'm sewing this side seam later. Very similar set of operations here for the back pattern. Just going to line up the shoulder from the front and just trace on the curve of the cape that I did for the front. And then honestly, I'll just trace the rest of this because might as well. If I've already drawn in the angle and the curve of the hem on the first piece, might as well just use it to trace on here for the back. And the only difference is, of course, lining up that shoulder seam left me with a little bit of extra flare at my center back, and no one minds a little bit of extra flare in a cape, do they? I don't think so. Just again, make sure this is 42 inches long. This is about a midi length on me, several inches past my knee. I was inspired to make some capes actually by watching some Valentino runway shows, and they do like to make a midi length cape, and I thought, what a chic idea. And I did see someone wearing a like midi length cape in all black wool once, and did think to myself at the time that that must be the height of Parisian chic. But it was just that simple to create the front and back of my cape pattern. You could probably make this just knowing your shoulder measurement, you know? You could probably guess. Uh, you don't have to start with a basic block, I bet. You could really find a way around that. It's just a big A-lined shaped piece of fabric, really. Honestly, you could probably use your A-lined skirt pattern. Uh, or definitely could use your circle skirt pattern, because all a full cape like a full circle cut cape really is, is a giant circle skirt that's cut with a smaller opening instead of for the waist for the neck. So if you wanted to make a circle cut cape or cloak, that's very easy because it's just a giant circle of fabric, whatever length you want it to be. And then, you know, the circle in the middle is for your neck instead of for your waist. But same general idea as making a circle skirt. Just takes a ton of fabric to do that. So, you know, be careful out there because fabric is of course expensive. And I was just using my front and back neckline measurements to draft a simple stand collar one and a quarter inch tall stand collar to go on this first wearable mock-up. Again, you'll see the fabric is very spectacular in just a moment, but um, I've drafted stand collars here on the channel before, so I can link you in a card up to a video where I do this in a little bit more detail, but I will cut that collar out of the scraps of this three-tone, I guess, brocade, because technically it's gold and blue lame threads or like lurex threads in a black polyester base here. This is a shiny brocade that I fell in love with on a trip to Joanne's when I was there for something else. But if you, if you show me a super iridescent fabric, it, the odds are I'm going to get some, let's face it. And I wasn't exactly positive what I wanted to make out of this. And when I needed to make a mock-up cape, I thought, you know, maybe we need like a iridescent space cape. And in the end, it does make me feel a little bit like Landau Calrissian. And I think you'll see what I mean when I'm modeling this later. Seeing as the main body of this cape is just three pieces, I went ahead and sewed my side seams in both the brocade fabric and then a bright blue lining. And I'm using that same lining to line my collar as well. The side seams for these, of course, have that gap in the middle for my hand and my arm to go through. So I just have to remember to leave that. I usually leave myself two pins in a seam if that's where I want to stop and start again. So that's what I've done here. Scoot up a little bit along this side seam and start sewing up the shoulder, run that curve of the shoulder up to the neckline here in this very sparkly fabric. It's quite spectacular. Luckily, I have some more left over. I would like to make a matching pencil skirt to wear with this, but I, I haven't found the time yet, sadly. Because, again, as I keep saying, I have more ideas than time, as ever, but especially right now. I 
And once that side seam is sewn here in the brocade, I will go ahead and press that open using my clapper a little bit here as well as my arm. No surprise there. Something as curved as this, I probably should have put clips in along the shoulder, but this Lurex brocade wanted to fray quite a lot. You can see I searched the edges of this before I started constructing it. So I was like, I don't want to clip this shoulder just because it's going to fray so hard. So I did not bother. Luckily, the fabric is kind of a looser weave, which is part of the reason it frays so much, which meant that I didn't really have to clip the shoulder. So I decided to, uh, to fudge it as it were, especially since this was just a wearable mock-up and a much more, I think people will be distracted by the brightness and sparkliness of the fabric more than whether or not my shoulders are perfectly smooth. You know what I mean? And I am just going to go ahead and bag line this. I've done all the same steps in this blue lining. And I can get back to my collar here as the collar is going to be the last step on this first little quick, quick and dirty mock-up cape here just to see if I like this pattern and see what modifications I want to make before I dive into some iridescent silk and wool next. But I sewed the top edge of my collar together here and I will go ahead and turn that right sides out after I clip my curves and corners and all such relevant nonsense on the inside of this so I can flip it right sides out and give it a nice press. This brocade is a little bit scratchy. The lurex in it is a bit scratchy so I wanted to make sure I lined the part that would be closest to my neck in the smooth funny blue polyester lining that I had laying around. It's kind of a satin face organza. This was a fabric that I had donated to my stash so thank you, that I felt went well with the royal blue in our metallic brocade here. But the rest of this cape is fully bag lined, so all I have to do now is attach this collar. I'm just going to pin this, you know, rather straight collar around the curviness of this neckline, which means I will have to clip this later, but luckily it'll be all encased, so I'm less worried about clipping the collar here. And this is curvy enough that I can't get away with not clipping it. But once that is on, of course, I sewed that brocade layer of the collar to the both layers of the cape and then left the collar lining free so I could turn it in like this and then I can slip stitch it down. I also need to slip stitch the openings in the side seam here for my hand slash arms that I left in those side seams. So I need to pin those together nicely and slip stitch those as well. Then I finished this cape off with a couple of golden hooks up here near the collar and my rather, I don't know, 80s <laughs> looking space cape is is complete. Um, it has a rather a strong shoulder and in this fabric of course comes off as a little bit space age 80s which is no problem for me because I like some space age 80s. I don't mind feeling like Landau Carizian but I do think I could wear this with 1940s things uh, for evening wear as well so I feel like I could wear this out to a jazz club or you know on an adventure on a star cruiser. I feel like it would work for either occasion right? And please ignore the fact that I definitely need a haircut, but just haven't made the time. Now for my second version here, I did want to go ahead and trim down that shoulder just because that little one and a half inch jut out that they suggested for the shoulder, nah, I cut that off and smoothed it out because I wanted to, I wanted the cape angle basically to start directly from the tip of my shoulder as opposed to have any, any extension. I saw so many uh, cape instructions showing to put that extension on there. And maybe it's fine in a floopier fabric, but in that stiff brocade and organza I used for the first cape, it really stood up and really added to the, the bold 80 shoulder of the first one. So I wanted to make sure for this wool and silk to peony second version of my cape here that I had the tip of the shoulder or the uh, flare start right at the tip of the shoulder. So that's what I've done there. And then I'm just going to add a little bit more flare to this version as well. So I'm adding on another wedge of fullness along the side seam and moving over that gap for my arm onto the new side seam that I'm creating here. Maybe flared it out an additional 30 degrees or so here. I'm just going to make it the same length as well. Although this second cape turned out a little bit shorter just because when it came time to just even out the hem, both the wool and the silk stretched quite a lot. So I was really glad that I left, let this hang for a good like 48 hours before I hemmed each of the layers for this one. For this wool and silk version, I did not bag line it just because the first one, I felt like those fabrics were both very stable and they weren't going to stretch much on the bias because this is an A-line cut. The fronts are on the straight grain and the sides really fall into bias. It's about 45 degrees almost, um, this A-line here. So they're really going to interact with bias and they're going to stretch at a different rate. So I wanted to make sure instead of bag lining the second one, because I had floopier fabrics that were going to stretch along that bias, that I let this hang and then retrude the hem. So after I retrude this hem entirely, it did come out a little bit shorter. Um, I think I would have preferred if it had come out like maybe two inches longer, but you know, this is the serendipity of how much a fabric is going to stretch and move around on you. Eh. 
I added that same extra bit of flare and shoulder modification to the back pattern as well. And then I just took a quarter inch off of the neckline of both the front and back, because instead of doing a collar on this second cape, I'm going to go ahead and make it a cloak by adding a giant fantasy inspired sort of fairy tale shaped hood. I've made two piece hood patterns here on the channel before. I've made three piece hood patterns here on the channel before. Today, I have a one piece hood for you. And all it is, is a 17 and a half by 17 and a half inch square that you can round off the front a little bit. You can round off the back a little bit. I'm going to leave mine pointed because I was actually inspired to make a midi length cloak like this by this Valentino coat from many years ago that has a pointed hood. So I'm just going to leave mine pointed, which means I have no trouble cutting this top edge along the fold. So this is a one piece hood today, not a two, not three, but just a one piece giant hood. I'll have to sew the back seam. And then of course I will line this buddy as well. You'll notice the neckline at the bottom of this is huge. That's because I'm going to go ahead and just gather this down onto the neckline of the cape itself. This is how my white cloak that I have in my closet is made. The only other cloak I have. For some reason I don't have a black cloak. We're still going to have to remedy that sometime. But that white cloak is like a costumey, I don't know, like Simplicity or McCall's pattern cloak that my mom made for me when I was about 11. And this is how the hood is made on that. So I just measured that hood and, and copied it. So I have no idea what big four pattern this hood comes from, but I copied it from a cloak in my closet, you know? And because I only had so much of this patina colored sage and rust green iridescent dupioni silk from Silk Baron to work with, I did have to put a center back seam in my lining, which of course no one will ever really see because it will be in the lining. So no big there. Sewed that together down the center back. And then I sewed the back seam of my hood in the silk lining and also in this green color of wool I'll be using for the outside of this cloak today. And sorry, my voice is running out of steam. I've done too much voiceover work today. And once again, I will need to sew the side seams in my main three cape pieces here. And the gap here I need to leave in my hands is indicated by these two pins. But I'll go ahead and iron the back seam of my hood in the silk and in this lovely green wool. And this green wool was also another donation to the stash. And I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to make out of it because it is rather thick and cushy and delicious. Um, but I don't work with a lot of thick fabrics because I do tend to get kind of frustrated with them. But I felt this project with very few seams was going to be a good place to put this wool to use. And there's not much more classic than a sort of mossy green thick wool cloak, is there? So that's about as classic as it gets. It kind of goes back to medieval times. You know, you can't really get much more old school than that. Although I'm not sure everyone had iridescent silk lining in their cloaks back in like Viking and medieval times. But I bet you they would like to, you know? I went ahead and sewed the front opening edge together, right sides together of my lining and the outer fabric for my hood here. And I just need to clip this little bit of curve that I put to the front opening like so, so I can press this flat. I will go ahead and throw some understitching in here as well, just because the silk is such a lightweight fabric compared to this thick coating wool. So I need to make sure that the silk wants to stay tucked inside my hood. Even this, I, I kind of need to tack it down along the back seam, I think, for it to really stay in place. So I'll have to do that sometime because even this, it was still flooping around in there a little bit, even though I understitched it. And we all know I do sometimes skip my understitching, but not today. And usually when I skip my understitching, it's because I'm going to do top stitching, which was not the case today. But now I can give that a nice press with a little bit of steam, hopefully mold everything into place for this absolutely giant hood. Who knew? 17 and a half inches by 17 and a half inches. Great size for a hood. Um, I don't know, maybe if you have a giant, a, a larger head or larger hairstyle, you will need even more room. Um, you can make, I mean, the Jedi robes actually in uh, Star Wars, they have absolutely gigantic hoods on those. So you can probably get away with like a 22 by 22 huge hood on those guys. But back to constructing the main body of the cloak itself, I need to sew my side seams in both the silk and the wool, of course. Again, leaving that gap for my hand slash arm to poke through side seams if I need to grab anything. In this case, instead of, you know, uh, I don't know, a laser sword, more like a, a broadsword, you know, depending. We have two very different styles of cape today. The first one is very like uh, Canto Bite, and the second one here is much more Sherwood Forest or something. And I do need to press open that side seam, and this time I will go ahead and clip that shoulder, just because I feel like these fabrics can handle it and I want everything to lay as flat as possible, using my tailor's ham to help press that open. 
And you can see where the gap, the opening in the side seam is. I just press that seam allowance, uh, open that same half inch. Then I will line that up with the wool later. Here I'm sewing only along the front edges. Instead of bag lining this, again, I'm just going to line the lining and the wool layers up along the front opening edges, the straight edges along the front of the cloak. And I will go ahead and understitch that seam as well. This is just a straight seam down the front of either side of the cloak. But I'm leaving the hems free here because I will hem each of these layers individually. Instead of throwing the collar on, of course, I have to put my hood onto the neckline of this cloak here. So I will sew the wool layer of the hood down to both layers of the cloak, and then I will hide that seam allowance into the hood lining, um, similar to how I did the collar, just a much larger piece, because of course the collar is a tiny little piece of fabric, and this thing is ginormous, which meant it was very fun to gather all this wool down to the neckline, because gathering in a bulky wool is not exactly the most fun thing. But I knew this was going to be the only, like, actually challenging part of this, is staying patient, keeping my cool while gathering this down. Um, I did only put the gathering into the wool layer for the hood, and I actually just like by eye pleated down the lining. So I'll show you that after we get the hood on here properly. But I'm just sewing the wool layer of the hood to both layers of the cape right now. And we'll deal with the hood lining in a moment. Take that back over here to the 99K. Luckily, this iron machine is strong enough to sew through anything, including leather. So she doesn't really have trouble with the uh, thick wool gathering here. But even with this machine, any thicker than, than this, I think I would be in trouble. like so. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and clip the neckline of this buddy, just because the neckline of the cape itself is quite curved. And I will go ahead and try and press that seam allowance up into the hood as best I can, but the wool and that little baby seam allowance, eh, it's hard to kind of mold it into place. It's more just steaming it into place and kind of moving it, felting it into the position I want it to be. But I will turn the hood lining inside a half inch match up the center back and get that into place. And then I'm just going to keep the front of this smooth and then put a couple of pleats in this once I get towards the back. And that's just kind of how I finished off this lining. Instead of gathering it, there's actually a piece of sawdust stuck in the weave of the dupioni here. So I was trying to get the piece of wood out of it. Don't know how that got there. Somehow a tiny piece of like wood chipping got into my fabric. Who knows? It is a natural fiber. Things are, nature is sometimes bound to intervene, you know? It didn't create a hole or anything, so it was just fine. But yes, I just started putting random sort of little pleats in here to pleat each side of this hood lining down. And then I will slip stitch this along the neckline edge here. So it will be an invisible finish, but I didn't, uh, you know, want to be too particular about this. It's just the, it's just the hood lining, although in this gorgeous patina silk fabric, um, but I wanted it to be kind of, I don't know, it's a fantasy fairy tale inspired little hooded cloak. So I don't feel like it needs to be precise in here. So once I have that slip stitched shut, it looks like this. And then once again, I put on some copper hooks this time to close this cloak. Of course, a nice big, like a uh, filigree cloak clasp would be nice, but they're a little bit pricey. And then I hemmed each layer of this after letting it hang and re the hem. I had my assistant, AKA my mom, help me pin that hem so that it was straight all the way around. I went ahead and hemmed this with bias tape made out of the same patina silk like so. And then right at the center back, I put in a little thread tack to hold the two layers together. They stick together pretty well, but just to hold them extra, I put a thread tack in here. And with something like this, you could put in as many thread tacks as you want to kind of hold the lining in place, even though each layer is hemmed separately. And hemming them separately also means that if one layer ends up stretching a little bit more, then the other over time, I can go ahead and re the hem once again and not have to deal with both layers if I only need to fix one of them. And then here is my final cloak sort of version of this. Again, at that sort of midi Valentino inspired length here, a sort of T length wool cloak, if you will, lined again in this patina iridescent dupioni silk from Silk Baron. This is not sponsored in any way, but I will link to that fabric below in case you are interested as well. I do love 
and iridescent silk, as we know. And despite being built around very similar foundation patterns, these capes did turn out very different uh, in terms of style. Of course, one is much more like 80s meets 40s Blade Runner Star wars -y kind of looking, and then the other is, of course, much more fantasy and almost could go hobbity, which is not usually my genre, but, uh, you know, one can dip their toe into fantasy every so often, and I might be doing it a little bit more here with a video coming up. But until then, I hope you enjoyed seeing how these projects came together today, and thank you as always for watching. I'll be back with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon, so I'll see you then. Bye!